The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the third chapter. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Okay, you may be seated. All right. So, this year for my uh, youth orchestra kids, I chose to um, feature songs from Motown. And partly why I did this is just because I love the music. But also, we spend a lot of time learning music. that was written a long time ago, or that was written by people who lived in Europe, or places that are far away. And I think it's such a great opportunity for, for the kids to be able to um, be so close to a place where um, something just in our recent past um, grew up and developed, and they can actually travel to the place um, and see things that they've been learning about, and reading about and see where the music that they're playing was actually created. And there's a lot of historical significance that goes along with the the music that was created during that time. I know we all have different associations with that time and that that history. Um, And I think it's really special that our pastor is where he is today um, because we we read a lot um, and we, we rarely get a chance to see the actual places um, or touch the things and see the things that, that were happening at the time and the places where Jesus and his disciples went. And sometimes we can forget almost that these were real places and real people um, and real activities. And there's a lot in our reading today um, that I'm sure as they're there, they're going to get to go to some of these places and see um, the sites of the stories that, and the history that we're learning about. So today, um, in our reading, we're we're learning about the baptism of Jesus. Jesus himself was baptized, and we honor that today. A lot of um, preachers around the country and probably the world today are talking a lot about baptism, and and, um, a lot of us worshiping are being encouraged to remember our baptisms. Um, Sometimes in congregations, they'll actually have special ceremonies on this day that involve water, Um, passing bowls of water around or people being sprinkled with water. Perhaps they can, you know, help to um, remember um, their own baptisms. Um, Many of us were baptized when we were babies, and so we might not remember that time. Um, I was not. Personally, I was baptized when I was 32, and um, I had a really um, great baptism experience. I got to experience that with my children, um, who also hadn't been baptized as children, Um, and that was a really special time. Um, When I think back on that, and I think back about what that signified to me, I can't help but connect it to all the time before and the people in my life who who prayed for me to get to that place. Um, Particularly, I think about my grandmother. Um, My grandmother uh, had, I think, a seventh grade education. Um, my, my father uh, was her son, and he was the first person in their family to go to college. And I believe with all my heart that she really only learned to read so that she could read the Bible. <laughs> she didn't really ever read anything other than the Bible, or sometimes um, magazines or commentaries about Scripture. Um, she was very, very well-versed, and um, to her, coming from um, the Ozarks, uh, where she grew up, um, there was not a lot of um, in-depth academic understanding of the Bible where theologians kind of take things apart and take a look at it. For her, it was a very day-to-day thing. And one thing I heard growing up, whenever we would go visit her, 
um, especially later on in her life when she had, she had cancer and her, her health was poor, um, anyone would say to her, you know, look at you, Grandma, you're doing great, you're, you're almost 80, you know, or you're almost 75, whenever we get to those ages. And she'd say, well, the Lord is saving me for the rapture. And I think every single night when she went to bed, she, with all of her heart, prayed that that would be her last day on earth, that the next morning she would wake up to find herself being taken up to heaven. And for the people that she lived near and the people that she communed with and went to church with, that was a very real and meaningful occurrence to them. Um, they looked forward to that because they wanted, it, they wanted to be with God. Uh, it's not that they hated their lives on earth. It's not that they hated their families or their friends or that they wanted to die. It's just that they knew that this was temporary and there was a better place that they were headed and that's how they thought of that as their real home. And a lot of the, um, to, in order to really understand some of the details about today's scripture, we kind of have to imagine that we're where our pastor is today and we're back thousands of years and among those people. Because the people that um, John was um, speaking to at this time that Luke tells us about, they, they walked around every day um, preparing for the apocalypse. They really believed that this coming Messiah that was foretold, um, when that Messiah arrived, that was going to be it. And they were going to head straight, straight to heaven and be with God. So they, they looked forward to that, but many of them also lived in fear of that. There were lots of rules and lots of laws that they had to follow, which um, some of them fell short of, most of them, probably all of them fell short of. So John's role at this time was um, confusing to many people. They thought that he might be the Messiah, um, and they wanted to be where he was. They wanted his blessing because that would comfort them and help them to know that they were going to be okay and they were going to be with God soon and be in heaven. Um, and what John repeatedly encouraged them to do was to repent, or to turn away from their sins, um, to turn away with the things that um, they might be doing that would go against um, what, God, what God wanted them to be doing. And so the baptism that they gave was a real um, physical way that they could be comforted, that they could be assured that they would have a place in heaven. And it was kind of an invisible mark also so that people who were baptized into this faith at the time were really distinguished from other people who weren't. So many people at this time were coming to John thinking that he was the Messiah and that he was kind of their ticket, um, their, their ticket to salvation. So it was really important um, what he said to them on this day, that he said that he was not, in fact, the Messiah, that he would mark them with the baptism that would be preparing them for what that Messiah would bring, which included this idea of, um, of the fire, um, the Holy Spirit and the fire. Now, most of us in our, in our world, and I think um, not even just here in this congregation, but out in the wider world, it's not as common for us to find people that um, necessarily think there's going to be a day um, where the apocalypse, apocalypse happens. But we do like to speculate it. There are movies about it. There are books about it. All kinds of people have an idea of what that's going to look like. And I know my grandma had a, a real specific idea. Um, in fact, I remember on her 80th birthday, she, had, she was very disappointed because I really think she thought that it was going to be that day, <laughs> and it didn't happen. Um, so some, some of us might still have that thought, but I know personally I don't walk around every day thinking, this might be it, this might be the day. Um, but we do all have a sense, I'm sure, of how broken the world is and how, how much violence and poverty and um, hurtfulness there is in it. Um, so we do have that um, calling from the scripture to continue to remark and remember our baptisms and be prepared um, for those things. But also the fact that Jesus himself came and, and um, humbled himself to be baptized by John in front of other people in community. He let them see that he maybe, you know, he, he's divine, but he was also fully human and he went through those same experiences that we did. Um, that's very important to this. And when I first read this scripture years ago, I remember thinking, wouldn't it be nice if I could hear 
a voice, boom, from heaven and just tell me, you know, when you're confused or you don't know what to do, wouldn't that be really nice if the heavens would open up and God would just say, do this, and then you would know what to do, right? It would be great. Um, but it just doesn't usually work that way. But the fact that um, we're told this, um, this event in that way, um, and just keep in mind that the people at that time were expecting the heavens to open up and for the wrath of God to rain down on people and um, they'd be separated out. The, the good people would go one place and something really awful would happen to the bad people. So the fact that on this particular day when Jesus was baptized, God chose to open up the heavens and instead send us a bird, a, a sign of peace, um, and to talk about love and talk about um, how pleased he was at, for, with Jesus as his son is really important for us to remember. And the last thing I wanted to say is just in this, this um, metaphor that's given here for the, for the wheat and the chaff and the winnowing um, and the fire. Um, I didn't know a lot about that, but during, during this time, well, now we have all sorts of technology. You know, we just, we go to the store and we, we pick up a, a bag of rice or a bag of barley and it's all ready for us. Um, it's all taken care of. But at the time, the people really, uh, this was their livelihood. They, they needed to harvest grain to make bread, to feed their families, and they also needed to feed their livestock with it. So the way that they would, would go through this threshing and winnowing process, every bit of grain that we still consume today, it comes with a, a hard kind of shell around it. Um, and that's the part that they wanted to se separate out the chaff. If we just went and plucked grain off the ground and ate it, that part of it wouldn't be something that our bodies could digest. So, um, so there was a lot of work involved for um, farmers and people who had livestock to separate that out. And they would do that in a couple different ways. One would be that they would pound it. Um, so some of the ones that were harder for the shell to come off, they would have to pound. But some of them were, were very easy, the shells were very easy to come off. And the way they would do it is they would just gather up big, big chunks of it and throw it up in the air and the wind would take the chaff off and it would just sort of blow away. So that's become a metaphor for us of separating not necessarily the good from the bad, but separating the worthless from the worthy. And um, the fact that John spoke about Jesus coming and doing more than just a baptism, that he would be going through this, this process of sorting through and um, getting rid of that which is worthless is, is very significant. Um, and I thought a lot this week about water in this story, water for baptism and fire, and I, and I realized how connected those things can be. I just had my son come home for Christmas and he brought his girlfriend. Her, her family's home was, and her childhood home was destroyed in the, the fires that went through near Chico, California. And I had seen that on the news and I knew what that was like, but getting to talk to a person who'd actually been through it um, was very, very different. Um, I had the impression in my mind that um, they realized the fire was coming and people went out and tried to call or notify people to tell them to leave their homes. And they did do that somewhat, but for the most part, she said that people looked out the window and saw the smoke and saw the fire coming. And those who realized it was impending got out as fast as they could, but it was a matter of 15 or 20 minutes before that fire was upon them and just consumed their entire homes. So we had just been able to be there in April and drive through the area and see where she grew up and all the homes. And she showed me pictures of what it looks now and everything is completely gone. So I thought about that a lot. Um, you know, that um, what, it's, what it's like, what, what's the difference um, for something to break or fall apart or disappear or something to be burned up, completely burned up and gone? Um, because of those fires, not only are a whole lot of people still missing, presumed dead, but also their, um, their homes, everything they owned in their homes is gone. Um, and because there had been fires 10 years ago in that area, those homes were all uninsurable. So the people who lost their homes, they're not going to get a check from an insurance company to go buy a new one. Um, everything is completely gone. 
Um, and I thought about that in terms of this, this scripture, um, that how devastating that would feel to me and for everything to be gone in that way. Um, would, I, would I want to go back and rebuild? Would I want to go somewhere else altogether? Um, how would I feel? Um, some things, yes, we could say it was all just stuff, homes, and, but some of that stuff is sentimental. It's things with pictures of our children growing up or memories of trips that we took, and those things would all be gone. And so in that sense, um, I thought about that a lot this week in preparing to talk to you and just thinking about how um, that's a very devastating way of looking at what fire can do. But a lot of times this scripture will be used, I think, to say, um, like I talked with the kids, in a Santa mentality. Um, be a good person, and God will reward you with a prize or a reward. Be a bad person, and you might get destroyed. <laughs> and some people take that very literally, and that sort of mentality gets passed down for us. But there's also a way that uh, Jesus coming into our lives um, it, it can really mess things up in a way, um, but at the same time, we, have, we always have this opportunity to rebuild and to find new ways um, to follow him and to do the things that um, we can do to feel that we have been um, grateful and uh, made worthy by his sacrifice. So as we go through the week um, and thinking about, you know, this might spark you to think about your baptism or your children's baptisms or your grandchildren's baptism, um, let's just remember to think about um, all, the, all the people around the world who um, might not have um, been exposed to this, this thinking or this idea and the people that we come into contact with during the week, how we can let them know that um, Jesus came to bring us all to God. Um, he did not come here to separate out the good and bad and, uh, you know, burn us up if we're bad. Um, and, and to think about that and, and the significance of that in terms of um, calling, personally calling the Holy Spirit to help us make those decisions. We might not hear that, we, I can almost say we definitely won't hear that booming voice from the heaven, um, but we might hear a quiet voice from inside our hearts that's coming from the same place. So thank you.